John Whitehead specifically. I got to see him in person uh, on September 30th at a food and farm freedom type event. Uh, Joel Salatin was one of the speakers talking about freedom to farm and freedom to eat what you want. And then the feature speaker after Joel was uh, John Whitehead. And Whitehead got up there and talked to us about some things that I knew. He talked about the Brandon Raub case. How many people are familiar with Brandon Raub at Chesterfield? Chesterfield, Virginia. This is a, this is a national uh, case, but it, it, it happened here in just outside of Richmond. Uh, how many people are familiar? I saw a couple hands. Okay, well anyway, Brandon Raub is, is this guy. I think he had a couple of uh, Marine tours at, in Iraq. I'm not sure, I think it was two. And he's back, he's not, uh, he's a former Marine in, in that respect. He lives uh, at home, I guess, just hanging out. Well, anyway, apparently the FBI and, and other organizations, the Department of Homeland Security and, and maybe some local police were interested in watching and following the kinds of things he was posting on his Facebook page. And not just his Facebook page, but his, his group chats that he had going on with his friends, his Facebook friends. And they didn't like the kinds of things he was saying. It's not clear exactly uh, uh, what they didn't like. He, had, he, did, he, he speculated about 9-11. Uh, a lot of people do that. Um, he, he didn't threaten anybody, but he was talking about liberties. He was talking about not really liking the government that much. So these guys, these guys, the FBI, um, Department of Homeland Security was represented. Uh, Sheriff's some Department. Sheriff's Department. Sheriff's Department. They had the local things. So this is like the fusion center, you know, wet dream, basically. A little bit of security from every level. Uh, they, they come to his house, and they, they say they're not arresting him. But, in fact, they put him in cuffs, and they take him away, not to prison, but to, uh, for basically an involuntarily mental incarceration. What do you call it's it? It's called a temporary detention order here in Virginia. Temporary detention order. And so they're going to truck him off to be seen by a um, shrink, a shrink, a government shrink, though. And there's a difference. Yep. And uh, because they actually refuse to let him see his own doctor. They, they for, you know, and, and there's a lawsuit. Well, anyway, bottom line is they, they did this to this guy. His mother screamed bloody murder. She was probably like a lot of people here. You know, she recognized that something wasn't right here, and she knew who to call, basically, the media and some other places. Um, he himself was resisting, but trust me, once they get their paws on you, you know, it's, it's not, you have to have people that know you, that care about you on the outside who have, who can get to the media, who can get to uh, places like the Rutherford Institute. Well, in any case, John Whitehead and the Institute took up this guy's case. Uh, they ended up within weeks, not too many weeks, really less than two weeks, I think they had him released. All, there weren't any charges. This basically the government wanted it to go away. Um, so anyway, th that's the story of Brandon Raub. A Virginian made national news. It's a really scary thing. Yes? They TDO'd him for three days because under Virginia law they can throw you into a, they can detain you for three days to evaluate you. And before the end of the three-day period, they had converted it from a three-day detention to a 30-day detention. Then they moved him away from all of his support structure down to the Veterans Hospital in Salem. They tried to. He, I don't think he ever... No, they moved him Did they him get down. him down yeah. there? Okay, yeah. Certainly that was their, the, their plan. And, and why did they move him to Salem? Well, it's a Veterans Hospital. He was a veteran. But that's where the government shrinks are, number one. That's where the government pharmaceutical dispensaries are, so they can, they can do that. And also... Uh, primarily to get him away from his, his support structure. But the Rutherford Institute and uh, I think a couple other uh, uh, financial support from different uh, groups like that, they came forward and they got this guy released. Now, that's the Brandon Raub story. It was a kind of a success story, but it's certainly a wake-up call that it could happen here in Virginia, and it did happen. But here's what's scary. When John Whitehead on September 30th, so Brandon Raub story had, had come and, and they'd had success, now there's some lawsuits pending, but Brandon himself is is uh, safe and free. John Whitehead gets up and tells this group, and there were, you know, several hundred people in the audience, and they weren't libertarians. They were food, farm, freedom, organic, crunchy greens, basically. <laughs> there were all kinds of people there, all kinds. I mean, there were some people that are pure liberty and kind of uh, anarcho-capitalist, but there were there were a lot of people who really didn't know, wouldn't even know what that meant. So he's standing up there. He tells them the Brandon Raub story, and then he says, when we got major media and people knew about this case and knew what we were doing and then we had success, they knew we had success. He said, we were flooded with calls from people all over the country, all over the 50 states or the 57 states, whichever version you, <laughs> we have, um, and telling them that stuff similar to this had happened to their friends, their relatives, their brother, their brother-in-law, whatever. And yet, 
they were and they were in the system now. They were in uh, involuntary condition of incarceration in their various states. If they were veterans, they're probably in the VA system. If they were not veterans, you know, whatever. Um, you know, I mean, we we could talk a long time about what it means when the state has its hands in everything. Because that means if the government takes you and puts you in a hospital and all the bills of that hospital are paid by the taxpayer, paid by the government, that's a government hospital, okay? Which means they'll do whatever they're told by the one who provides them the food. I mean, we don't, we don't bite the hand that feeds us, and this is a dangerous thing about government dependency at all levels. But anyway, um, he, he, uh, he calls these, he told us, he said, I got a lot of these calls, wasn't anything I could do. Many of these things had happened in the past year or so. He calls them disappearances, disappearing. And I don't know how many people here study Central America, South America in the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But, you know, uh, in fact, there's lots of different movies about it. Uh, but this disappearing of people, basically the knock on the door. It's not just communist Russia in the 1930s. The knock on the door, you're gone, and that's it. They don't hear from you again. They might find you someday. They might find you dead, they might find you alive. You might be released, but it, bottom line is you disappeared. And you disappeared because you angered the government. We have that going on in this country. And I personally consider myself, some, you know, I stay on the internet, I read stuff, I think I know what's going on. And when he told that, when John Whitehead told that group that, everybody, nobody really, I mean, we could not believe it. Even people predisposed to believe it, like myself, were shocked. Because that's the country you're growing up in. That's the country you're inheriting from a bunch of people, uh, many of them will, you know, talk about constitution and talk about liberty, talk about land of the free, and they don't know what the hell they're talking about, because that's not the country you're living in today, and that's not the country you're going to have to deal with. Um, it is a dangerous, dangerous place, um, and it's not dangerous because of the way, you, you know, your parents tell you, oh, college is dangerous, you might, you know, there's car wrecks, there's all kinds of things that can endanger you. No, your government is dangerous to you, and this is what I kind of learned. Well, anyway, I've got a short video here uh, from that. Um, one, one quick thing, his last sentence in the uh, commentary news release that he put out about the, the lawsuit that he's filing against the Virginia, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, Inspector General of Virginia, because he says, you know, this, laws were not followed, they were violated because they just basically wanted to get this guy. But his final thing is, the attorneys point out that if Facebook posts and other forms of expression like Ralph's which make no serious threats of harm to any person, can form the basis of involuntary civil commitment, then Americans no longer enjoy free speech. It's just that simple. And there, that's are, there are a lot of veterans who postulate they're doing this primarily to veterans to, to because once you're in the system, right. you can no longer possess weapons. That's you can right. no longer own it's weapons. It's also very likely to be uh, one of the side justifications of the government's part of doing this, because it is risky. I mean, you know, people, you might get the wrong politician's kid. You know, you never know. You could pick up the wrong guy and have a problem. They picked up Brandon Rubb, didn't think anything would happen. Something did happen. They were embarrassed. They got egg on their face. They had to release him, and it got a lot of publicity on the kinds of things they're doing. But one of the benefits is, uh, for the government, is these guys are now unable to, you know, but they can't own weapons. going to have to sue to get his rights back. Yeah. Because it, I mean, he, do, he didn't own any weapons either. That was the weird thing about him. This guy who's supposedly so dangerous, he didn't. He never bought any weapons. He never owned any weapons. But now he's prevented from doing so in the future until he gets his rights back. Yep. So you turn on your television, your newspaper, read your newspaper. This is John White at five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. I'm going to see something about fear. We live, we live in a culture of fear. Uh, to those who are alert, the SWAT team going through people's yeah. doors up to 7,000 a year for the simple possession of marijuana. We're Packy's fear from our politicians. We are told to fear terrorists, our next door neighbors. We have the government actually uh, watching people who are taking pictures of monuments or whatever, reporting them to the police. And some of those people, actually, some of those people are getting uh, investigated. Uh, the Department of Defense has been spending billions of dollars on local police agencies, sending tanks, armored vehicles, flak jackets, helmets. So the culture has become totally militarized. What we're seeing is the cowing of a population that's happened in historical regimes before where the army or the police basically in, in authoritarian regimes take control and people who exercise their rights in the streets as we saw with the Occupy movement or other movements. Some of the Tea Party people you get sprayed in the face, some people get shot with rubber bullets, tasers. The police have all these uh, devices. Enter the war on terror. 
The war on terror is the logical endpoint of constructing governmental policy based upon fear and paranoia, marked by constant surveillance, torture, kidnapping, extrajudicial killing by our own government, our president acting as a hitman, uh, sending drones out to kill people, even American citizens. This has resulted in the loss of our rights, and it's the culmination of a mentality of fear cultivated by the political elite, and amazingly, it's willingly accepted by the American people. A real case in point is the Department of Homeland Security in the aftermath of 9-11. Supposedly, the Department of Homeland Security was tasked with protecting the American homeland from terrorist threats. However, the DHS, as we call it, the Department of Homeland Security, has become more of a domestic army than a security agency. For example, in March 2012, defense contractor, ATK, agreed to produce 450 million hollow point bullets to be used by the Department of Homeland Security and its Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office. The Department of Homeland Security also placed another order after that for 750 million rounds of various ammunition in August 2012. The Department of Homeland Security is not the only federal agency buying such militarized equipment. Consider that in August 2012, the Social Security Administration placed an order for 174,000 rounds of hollow point ammunition to be distributed throughout their offices throughout the United States. It's unclear why the Social Security Administration, which is supposedly tasked with sending out checks to people to make sure people can live on some kind of income, would need hollow point bullets. Hollow point bullets are killer bullets. In other words, if they hit you, they enter your body, collect flat flesh, and there's a huge hole in the back of you. If it hits your arm, your arm flies off. Uh, when I was in the Army, we were restricted and not allowed to use hollow point bullets because of their killing nature. So the question is, why are these agencies, federal agencies, is this, is this part of the fear and paranoia we're seeing? Why are these agencies buying hollow point bullets? Billions at a time. The Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration aren't the only federal agencies beefing up their ammo supplies. In August 2012, believe it or not, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which houses the National Weather Service, requested 46,000 hollow point bullets to be sent to locations throughout the United States. The Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration later released a statement claiming the ammunition is tended for the Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement. What we're seeing, I think, is not only fear and paranoia being peddled by the government, but our government has bought into fear and paranoia. Hollow point bullets, as I said, are intended to kill. And believe it or not, a populace that realizes that the man standing across from you has got a hollow point bullet, and he's dressed in a Kelvar helmet, and looks like a stormtrooper coming through your door, you're going to hit the floor. There's no more asking for a warrant or for your rights. Uh, no amount of freedom has ever been won by standing around and not saying something about these kind of things. Uh, these are very dangerous moves. Again, why would the Weather Service and the Social Security Administration need hollow point bullets or bombs, for example, or coming soon drones? So, uh, our freedoms are hanging in the balance. Uh, these are all facts. These are all footnoted facts. In fact, you can go to our website, read my commentary, and I'll make sure I'm getting the right title for you here. The Politics of Fear and Fear in America, a Nation at War with Itself. The Politics of Fear in America. We don't have to be fearful, though. We still have our Constitution. Stand up for your freedoms, folks, or uh, it's not going to be long before they're going to be gone. Okay, great. Uh, how many people have watched this already before? Just kind of came out. If you, if you subscribe to the Rutherford, uh, it's Rutherford.org if you want to go there. He's got a great library of all kinds of things. It's a really uh, well kept up uh, uh, website. And you can subscribe to the, the mailings there. And I would encourage you to do that in part because it's a Virginia <coughs> organization. Um, and it's friendly to, uh, even though he's pro-liberty, he almost sounds like ACLU aggressive guy. Uh, this is also very much a pro-life organization. The other half of the Rutherford Institute is very pro-life, and um, a lot of the, so so it's, you're not going to scare off conservatives if you talk about the Rutherford Institute. You're not going to scare off conservatives if you share with them material from the Rutherford Institute. And really, um, one of the um, as I'm you know driving over here, just thinking about because I'm kind of uh, have to say you know I'm not optimistic. I am not 
optimistic. I wasn't optimistic last year. I wasn't optimistic five years ago, ten years ago when I got the mill. I was not optimistic, and I'm not getting more optimistic. I'm getting more, more and more concerned uh, with with how. Uh, and he mentioned it here. He's he's written some other things as, uh, on it, and a lot of other people have too. But how we're being conditioned. We're being conditioned to basically pay lip service to the Constitution, but not live the Constitution. Uh, pay lip service to our civil liberties, the fact that they exist, that they are not to be interfered with, not granted by government, they can't be taken away by government, um, they're protected from the government, that that's the nature. We, we, we say that. We all say that and we're taught that, supposedly, but, in, but we're not internalizing it at all. What we're internalizing is authority must be obeyed, and quite frankly, uh, there, there's, a, there's a short window of time in, in the normal life cycle of human beings, and you guys are in it, okay? And us old folks are not so much in it. Maybe we're aberrations. But when, when opposing authority, thumbing your nose at authority, you know, saying some choice words to authority, okay, it, it's natural to the, to the young people in general. But the school systems are doing a great job of basically beating you down keeping you ignorant. Um, so, so what do we got to do? You, you've got to help other people see a little glimpse of what's <laughs> really happening. And how do you do that? Well, you can't just give it to them all in one chunk because if they've been conditioned by the public schools, if they are not thinking about these things in, in the context of history, in the context of politics, in the context of liberty, which most people are not, you people probably are, most people aren't. So how do you get them to become aware? Well, you got to use the way we communicate, okay, in your social media. So you share videos that are short, that tell you, that, that get people, that kind of awaken them. Um, and that's another reason I give you the Rutherford Institute, but there's lots of other organizations uh, like that. How many people read Lou Rockwell? Okay, now he, it's, it, what is it, it's, it's peace, gold, and and it's an anti-state, anti-war, whatever. So that, you know, it turns a lot of people off. I mean, Lou Rockwell. It's supposed to be racist, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, if you don't want to, you know, you want to kill the right, the right race, then you must be racist, yeah. Um, sure. So Lou Rockwell, I, sh I share stuff from Lou Rockwell with a lot of people. And there's a lot of people who I respect and like and, and consider allies in this cause of liberty who do not like <laughs> to receive, you know, don't, if they see Lou Rockwell there, they're not going to be receptive to it. Um, that's why the Rutherford Institute is really good for Virginians, especially here in this area. I don't know, you know a lot of y'all may not have grown up here uh, in this part of Virginia, but a lot of you probably are from Virginia. You, you may well be from uh, quasi-conservative and socially conservative uh, communities. Well, the Rutherford Institute is socially conservative. At least it passes for that. It's also radically pro-liberty, liberty, which is which is very exciting. But it's 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 shareable to people who otherwise you wouldn't be able to share stuff to. Uh, and we know this, you can't, if you, you know, people just shut you down. They, they cannot, they can't hear it. Another one might be the Acton Institute, A-C-T-O-N, Acton.org. Yep, Acton, Acton Institute is another one. And, um, and there's actually a number of, uh, uh, the, the Future Freedom Foundation, it's out of Reston, they, they uh, put out neat things, uh, antiwar.com. Has has a lot of good stuff, and they're they're good on civil liberties, and of course they're good on they're good on war. Um, it seems increasingly that the conversation about our liberties, the conversation about our freedom, about uh, what we like about the Constitution that's that's being frittered away, that we'd like to preserve, and it's it's there's very little left of it. That conversation seems to take place on one part of society. The, the, some people might call them the remnant. Uh, certain sectors of society can have that conversation, they're interested in that. But the vast majority of people, and you may know this from just the campus, and I can't speak for the, the people here on the campus, but I certainly know in my community, the vast majority of the conversation right now is we got to get Obama out and we got to put, Ob put Romney in. That's, that's what, or, or, or vice versa. It could be we got to keep Obama in and we got to make sure Romney doesn't, you know, keep Obama and make sure Romney doesn't usurp his, his rightful position as emperor of, of this United States empire. Um, but, but that's the conversation that they're having. That's what is gripping them. And, it, and it, I'll tell you, I don't know how many old people you know, this part of, this part of Virginia, you're anybody over 50, they're, they're worried about Obama. I mean, they are worried. And if you go to Northern Virginia, where they, they live off the teat of government, they're kind of worried about Obama losing. 
They like they worried about Romney coming in here, boy. He's probably not going to cut anything, but he's whispering. He's talking about it. Well, guess what? None of them are going to cut anything. Okay, they're both statists. They love the state. Okay, um, and and the thing is though, people that care about liberty. We're not even we're not even in the same. We can't communicate very well with people that right now in this in this moment in time are just obsessed with either this guy winning or that guy winning. And they cannot see that these two candidates are not just the same in any way that matters, but they're representing a sameness in our society, which is, which is supporting, quo. it's the status quo, and it's statism, and it's, and it's what's tolerating and allowing this growth of the, of the basically a police state in this country. You know, and, and yeah, we have freedom, and we can sit around and talk here with the door open. Sure, we can do that. But if they're disappearing people, and uh, what John Whitehead told us was tens of thousands were the numbers. He, he said in California, it was over 40,000 people had been involuntarily incarcerated. It's, it's up in the thousands here in Virginia, too. Yeah. So, so yeah, we can talk freely, and we can post all kinds of crap on Facebook, and we can share things, and we can hear about these things. But if in Virginia you've got ten or twenty or thirty thousand people that are being involuntarily about incarcerated, 10 million. yeah, what is and, and we don't even know about it. We hard, you know, I found out about this basically two or three weeks ago, and and I'm predisposed to be looking for this kind of thing. I'm predisposed to think the worst of government, and yet, you know, I was surprised. So yeah, we're the land of the free. Up until the time, then we're not. Okay, up until the time that we wake up and realize that we're not. So um, he's right. You gotta, you gotta live your freedom. You gotta take action. And we do need to build bridges with people in a way that they can understand what we're saying. And if it's a conservative, share with them Rutherford Institute, Acton Institute. If they're a historian, there are places you can, you can share information. We can talk about the history of the growth of the state. So you know, there's lots of ways to connect with lots of different groups. And I think um, uh, a very negative way or depressing way to look at it as well. We all want to survive. Well, let me tell you, you don't survive on your own, you survive through your networks. So those networks have to include people that aren't just us people, that are not just anarcho you know, uh, capitalists, are not just libertarian minded people. Our networks are going to include far beyond that. So it is our job since we see it, it's our responsibility, since we see what's coming and we understand it in a way that really, quite frankly, you know, you guys are the cream of the crop in that you are seeing and interested in this, you are recognizing that something is very wrong. Okay, so, but we've got a network, we've got to teach and educate lots of other people and build our networks up. So worst case scenario, our networks will keep us out of. Um, Brandon Robb didn't, you know, didn't get locked up and disappeared. And he didn't because his mother screamed a bloody murder. Because even though his mother's a different generation and she probably supported the Iraq war, the man went there twice to fight. She probably thought that was a patriotic thing to do, right? So she's not, she's not all anti-war, but she was predisposed to question government authority, okay? So we need to build our network and grow our network of people that are predisposed to questioning. And you can do it in, there's a zillion ways to, to do it, but that's, that's <coughs> kind of what we, we have to do. And that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. And you do it one at a time. Sure, sure. You do it one at a time. And we have huge benefit, at least for now, with, with the, uh, uh, the social media and the internet. Now, of course, you know, the CIA, the FBI, every government in the world, it's all over. Every part of the internet. And how many people know about the, the big uh, NSA center in Utah that they're constructing? Have you heard about that? Who's heard about it? Raise your hand if you heard about the big, uh, it's Southeast Salt Lake City. It's a massive NSA data center. And it's been under construction now for a couple years, but it was funded a few years ago. And um, it's, it's there to basically the, the giant vacuum cleaner, not just of the NSA that when I worked at it in the mid-90s, which was, was focused. Echelon. Yeah. Echelon simple. Compared sure. To oh, yeah. And plus, we were at that time in the mid-90s, uh, we were just transitioning into the illegality of monitoring Americans. We were just having a little dilemma with that. That dilemma has been solved, people. They're monitoring. Americans, they were, they're scooping up all this stuff. And that will facilitate if we tolerate this other stuff, like the disappearing, the incarceration, the growth, the, you know, who, who in the world, how, how dare they take money out of my pocket and buy a hollow point and put it in the hand of some jerk that works at TSA? How dare they? And yet they do it. They're very, they, they you know, they, you gotta give them one thing. They got brass ones. They, they're doing it right in front of us well, with our money. And, and Homeland Security, they're running, they're running roadblocks now in Tennessee 
in Texas, mm -hmm. not just on the borders, well within side our borders, they're running, they're running roadblocks yeah. and they're doing checkpoints. That's right. That's right. And the TSA is expanding as as the complaints in the airports lead some states and some systems to say, well, we'll we'll go ahead and reprivatize that security function, which is basically as it had been. Basically, it was the, the airlines themselves would provide the security. Um, the TSA, like all government, this is the nature of government, you know it, it's to grow, 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 expand, always search new missions, never give old missions away, but get new missions. Well, the new mission for the TSA, trains, buses, all the places you thought you could be a little anonymous, a little bit quiet in your travels, just, I just want to get away. No, <laughs> TSA is everywhere, and they're doing everything they can get away with. This is Obama's promise of creating a civilian army that was as well armed as our military is. And there's a lot of them, even yeah. here in Harrisonburg. Yeah, that's right. And I always say, we used to say, in my, I have four kids, we say, well, somebody, either my kids or one of the cousins, somebody's got to be a lawyer because you've got to have a lawyer. And I now think that you need somebody working for DHS in your, in, your, in your blood clan and somebody working for FBI, somebody where blood's more valuable and they'll at least tell you what's, if you're getting ready to be disappeared, you might get a phone call from your network. Yeah, that's wishful thinking, really. But um, anyway, this it's not it's not a pretty picture. So I, I kind of would want to hear just if you don't mind uh, what's on your mind. What was your? I mean, you hadn't seen this particular video. How many people are kind of aware of this? 